Well, he says my name like y'all should remember me from back in the day. Uh, and as the days get older and my hair gets whiter, that day seems a long time ago. Um, I'm talking about uh, some very new technologies uh, that uh, have been around for a while, but they're still being freshly discovered and deployed throughout our IT community. Um, my associates and I, have a, we started a company even during the middle of all the recession of the last five or six years. Uh, We've managed to uh, get a new business uh, bootstrapped and started and a bunch of people hired here in Charlotte and also in other cities. So uh, at least from our point of view, the future looks bright and the technologies have been very interested. As you know, I go back in technology very, very long ways, um, way, as far as most of y'all <laughs> yeah, with the same number of years in IT. My associate is... Kurt Mellon, he goes back quite a few years in telephony, in telephone world, also in IT in terms of networking, network designs, and overall architectures. So from uh, his experience, he's going to bring us up to date a little bit about the history of some of the networking that we administer and run in our various companies throughout uh, the day. So. I will be here to answer the hard questions. Kurt will be able to answer most of them on his own, but if not, he'll blame it on me and uh, I'll stand up and do my soft shoe as usual. Kurt? Thanks, Mike. Is this on? Okay, very good. I'll put this up here. Uh, again, as, Mike, whoa. as Mike said, I'm uh, Kurt Mellon. I'm responsible for this thing's pretty hot. I'm responsible for business development for 2020 Voice. We're a voice services company uh, located here in Charlotte. Um, Mike is one of our partners, as he said. Mike is also one of your members. Um, this presentation will follow on in part to a presentation that Mike did earlier. Um, as I understand it, you did a presentation earlier on an internet, internet timeline discussion. Okay, and what we're going to do is follow on to that this evening in terms of some interesting internet technology and what 2020 Voice has done with it specifically. First, we're going to go through a brief history of public networks. Um, and another reason we're going to go through the uh, history of public networks is because public networks still affect how services are conceived of and delivered today, and they affect everything that touches what we all do in this room for a living. We're going to talk about the history of computers, specifically the history of computer networking, um, the history of storage. We're going to go into um, a more broad and specific um, discussion of voice over IP, the origin, the history, um, some interesting ideas that we've developed in VoIP. And my objective for this evening is to leave you with a broader understanding of how VoIP operates and the implications on SMB and enterprise networks and give you easier ways to manage your networks. Before we go any further, uh, how many IT managers do we have in the room this evening? Show of hands. So we have no IT managers in the room this evening. Anybody have any experience with VoIP in the room this evening? Show of hands. How many are running VoIP in your networks? How many have experience with uh, the traditional public switch network? And I'm talking about the Bell system and the Bell hierarchy. Okay. So what I want to do is I want to um, start with a uh, just touching on a brief history of um, what we call the public switch network um, in terms of um, how the original public switch network left a legacy that affects how we deliver products and services today and affects every one of our networks because at some point in time, regardless of where you were in IT, your networks touched the public network in some way, shape, or form. I also want to leave you with some ideas of how you can achieve independence from the public switch network and some of the ideas that we have using VoIP. Let's uh, start by talking about what a network is. Uh, we're all IT professionals. We all use the term network. What, what is 
What does the word network mean to us? If we were to define a network for somebody, what, would, what, what components would it have? And this is where we can be interactive. Shout it out. A path to travel. Involves communications. Any ways that communi computers communicate with each other? A good, broad, simple term of a network is a group or a system that interconnects people or things. So that can be a network of people. It can be a network of technology. That's a good, simple, simple def uh, definition of the network. How many were in IT before the Internet? That's a dangerous question to answer and to ask in this room. Most of us were in IT before the Internet. The reason I ask this question is because when you use the word network, most people come uh, conjure up a vision of the Internet in their mind. Most people don't have a concept of what networks were before the Internet. And the reality of the situation is that networks go back into the early 1800s. The very thing that we call the public switch network goes back to the days of the telegraph because the telegraph was really the first means that people had of communicating in real time over distance. Eventually, tele telegraph networks accommodated telephones. Well, okay. That's why I threw the word real time in there. And I also threw the word distance in there. So while technically they were able to communicate over distance, and technically they were using, I guess, a form of binary code, if you talk about the broad United States, really the first means of communicating over great distance in real time was, were the tele, uh, telegraph networks, which eventually became the telephone networks and eventually evolved to enable machines to communicate with each other. So with that as a backdrop, a picture of uh, the telephone network in New York City in 1887. It was said on a particularly sunny day, you could see the sunlight on the street level. This is a picture of some folks extending that network out into the, the countryside in 1907. The message here is that the original public telephone networks were a series of poles with multitudes of wires strewn about the cities and the countryside. Anybody in the room know Morse code? Any idea what that says? Excuse me? No, no. It's a little more germane to the presentation. It says early networks in Morse code. Uh, anybody know who invented Morse code? Samuel Morse. Very good. Anybody know who invented the telephone? I hear Alexander Graham Bell. Do I hear any other takers? Excuse me? Well, there was a French guy named uh, Jean Baudot, and I'll get into him a little bit later. He invented uh, what became the teletype machine. He was responsible for the Baudot code, uh, code, and when I get to the modem page, we'll talk about uh, Jean Baudot. But who, anybody else invent the telephone? There's an interesting story behind the telephone. The telephone was invented. The identical device was invented by two men. Alexander Graham Bell and another man by the name of Elisha Gray. Elisha Gray was one of the principals in Western Electric. Anybody ever hear of Western Electric? Okay. Western Electric was uh, an equipment manufacturer that was absorbed into AT&T in 1915. So uh, Elisha Gray was a pretty substantial individual. The way the story goes was Elisha Gray and Alexander Graham Bell both submitted their patent applications to the Patent Office in Washington, D.C. on Valentine's Day, 1876. This is where it gets interesting. Alexander, uh, um, Elisha Gray showed up at 9 o'clock promptly and put his application in the in basket. Alexander Graham Bell showed up two hours later and put his application on the in basket. Apparently, the uh, patent clerk's work for the day began immediately after Alexander Graham Bell put his uh, application in the inbox. Conspiracy theories abounded. Early connections were done manually on a switchboard, whether it was telephones or telegraphs. And it wasn't until the mid-1880s that the first automated network element came to be. It was called the Stroger switch. 
Anybody heard of the Stroger switch? Anybody know the story? Somebody heard of the Stroger switch, that's good. Know the story? The story is actually a little more interesting than the story about Elisha Gray and Alexander Graham Bell. The story goes something like this. A man named Almond Stroger was an undertaker in 1880s Kansas City. The undertaking business was brisk in 1880s in Kansas City. Uh, Almond Stroger's business was cranking along very nicely until the telephone appeared in Kansas City. Suddenly his business went in the tank. Almond, being the inquisitive sort, learned that one of his competitor's wives was operating the local switchboard. This is, this is not a lie. This is the truth. One of his competitor's wife was operating the local switchboard because everything was being done manually. She was connecting all the business to her husband, who was an undertaker. Almond conceived of the idea of an automatic switch, and he went about uh, trying to conceptualize that, and was very fortunate that uh, Almond's brother and his nephew had both the electrical knowledge and the means to realize that concept. So the, um, the, uh, the Stroger switch was the very first automated network in the uh, automated uh, element in the uh, public network. Point is, whether calls were connected manually or by an automated switch, this established the centralized hierarchy of the public switch network. So this is really the point where the public network started to come to be because we had a point of automation that it established a centralized hierarchy that is with us today. A couple decades ensued and the hierarchical evolution of the public switch network continued and it's affectionately known today to insiders as the PSTN. The public switch hierarchy is five layers. This is the basis of the public network. This is the end office or the central office. It's also known as the class five office. Class 5 office interconnects all phones within a locale and provides dial tone to all the phones. There are roughly 19,000 of these in the United States. They're also known as uh, central offices, end offices, and, and, and uh, branch exchanges. There is such a thing as a private branch, branch exchange, which is a, basically a central office for a large company. Uh, we have a product called a virtual PBX, which is based on the concept of a private branch exchange. There are five, five tiers of the hierarchy, and I'm going to briefly step through each one of them. Class 4 office is called a toll center. And Class 4 offices switch traffic between Class 5 offices, offices that don't have interconnections between them, and they also take overflow traffic from the trunks between the Class 5 offices. Class 4 office is also the on-ramp to the long-distance network. Class 3 office is called the primary office. The primary office takes overload traffic from Class 4s and also routes traffic uh, off of busy trunks um, from uh, Class 4 to Class 4. Class 2 office is called a sectional center, and it connected the major toll centers together. So if you, if you can see how the hierarchy is starting to form. Toll centers can, are consist, consist of uh, Class 3 and Class 4s, and Class 2 switch traffic in between them. The Class 1 office is called a regional center, and it connects overflow traffic from the classes of offices beneath it. It also serves as a gateway to the international PSTN. So this established the hierarchy that's still with us today. And each level in the uh, uh, hierarchy was used to interconnect lower levels that were otherwise not connected or had overflow traffic. So let's talk about what happens when Somebody in, say, Key Biscayne wants to uh, call somebody on Catalina Island in California. This, this will show how the call set up and how they connect across the United States. By the way, when I was, uh, I want to say, in my early 20s, I had the opportunity. I was in the exhibit business at the time, and I uh, built exhibits for a number of uh, the Bell companies and Bell Labs. And one of the things I had the opportunity to do was build a traffic board exhibit that was in Bell Labs in Murray Hill, and it depicted just this this very uh, sequence that I'm about to go through, except it did in fiber optics. Really, really, have you ever been, anybody ever been to Bell Labs? No? Okay. Mike has. Did you see the exhibit there? Okay. 
So what happens when somebody wants to call from, say, Bicus, uh, Key Biscayne, Florida, across the country to uh, Catalina Island? They pick up their phone, they get dial tone, and they connect, they're connected to the central office. Because it's a long distance call, the central office is going to set up a path to the four, the four tiered hierarchy on the East Coast. So that call is going to go up to the toll center, it's going to go to the primary center, the sectional center. The regional center on the East Coast is going to look for a path across to the West Coast, which is going to connect to the hierarchy on the West Coast. The local toll center is going to connect to the end office, and the end office is going to ring that, that phone on, on Catalina Island. So what would happen if somebody in Florida wanted to call? What would happen if that guy in Key Biscayne wanted to call somebody in Florida? Where would it travel over the network? It'd probably go up to the toll center, and depending on where it was in uh, Florida, it would just go to the uh, local end office off that toll center. What if somebody wanted to call somebody in Virginia? It'd probably get up to a level three and hand off to a, uh, a level four and then to a level five. I spent 15 years with a company called MCI, and one of the things that we were very proud of ourselves about was that we had what we called a flat network. We didn't have this hierarchy at all. Uh, has anybody had the occasion to fly Southwest Airlines? Okay. What, what differentiates Southwest Airlines from the, from the major carriers, if you will? They're hubless, exactly. That is the hallmark of a flat network. And we were very impressed with this because we started building this in the late 70s. What we had was effectively end office switches that carpeted the United, straight, uh, United States. MCI at its zenith had 100 of those class 5 switches or end office switches. And we ran all traffic between available trunks uh, at the edge of the network. So you could, you could say that the way this network was constructed was one of the first um, dispersive multipath networks, to use one of Mike's terms. It wasn't exactly routers, but it was the basic architecture for a a dispersed multi-path network. The only time we went above the, uh, the, the edge switches was later in MCI's development where we put in uh, tandem switches or, or class one switches that were basically long haul switches from east coast to west coast or international gateways. But at MCI's height we had about 90 of those end switches and about a dozen of those uh, tier one switches. Numerous technology, technology advances kept the PSTN and technology leadership over the last century, and I'm going to go through a couple of the highlights here. You remember the, uh, the picture of the, uh, the wooden poles with the wires strewn about the countryside? Sorry. Well, I'm going to get in. Uh, one, of, one of the um, uh, seminal improvements of the public network is microwave, and I will touch on that. Absolutely. As a matter of fact, I'll tell you a little story about MCI. We, uh, MCI stood for something, obviously. Originally, it stood for microwave communications. When we were bringing in, tw uh, Mike, Mike and I are veterans of, my, uh, of MCI. We reached our zenith in 1996. We brought in $20 billion. And we delivered a dollar per share to every shareholder. So internally, we, we, we knew MCI is money coming in. But we will talk about microwave. So you remember those uh, wires strewn about the countryside? That was sustainable only for a period of time. Can you imagine such a thing in the environment that we live in today? Wires all over the countryside blocking the sunlight to the street. It was necessary to come up with something called a pair gain system, which enabled the phone company to modulate more than one signal onto a pair of wires. Paragain systems eventually became frequency division multiplexing, which enabled lots of calls to be modulated onto a single pair, and ultimately time division multiplexing, which was the beginning of the digital side of the, uh, the public network. Out of band signaling, now part, think about that hierarchy, again, that bell hierarchy. You make a call from point A to point B. Your call goes in the talk path to the central office, in the talk path to the toll network, the whole way up through the hierarchy and the whole way across. Out-of-band signaling took the signaling out of the call path and put it on a data network that actually could do look-ahead routing, which set up calls much faster. So post-dial delay was, was uh, decreased, and e efficiencies of networks in general was radically increased. Anybody encounter one of these varmints? Yeah, I kind of thought so. <laughs> Modems introduced data networking to the broad market. Prior to modems, uh, machines were connected by... Uh, 
relatively high capacity circuits, uh, very expensive nailed up circuits. What the modems did was take the zeros and ones off of computers and translate them into tones that could be transmitted across an analog network and then remodulated into zeros and ones that a computer at the other end could understand. Does anybody know where the name modem came from? Modulate, demodulate. Modems, uh, modem, the speeds of modems were measured in something called a baud. Back to, back to the point about the baud. Anybody know what a baud is? Excuse me? A baud is, is one bit per second. So that's, that's, the, that's the means by which we measure the speed of modems. And again, um, Jean Baudot was, uh, we, we came to the, uh, the term baud because Jean Baudot was the inventor of uh, supposedly the first digital uh, telegraph. And John Baudot is the inventor of this thing that we call the teletype. You recall people, uh, rich people reading their stock tapes coming off a machine in their office? The teletype was originally a keyboard and a, a distributor at each end that enabled somebody at the remote end to input information via a keyboard. It wasn't a QWERTY keyboard. It only had five keys. And it printed out a tape on the other end with information that people could supposedly understand. Um, how many of us in the room have experience with 56K modems? I would guess everybody. 28.8, Anybody with experience with 10, the original acoustic modems? You all are what we in the business call owed. Voice, voice digitization led to the digitization of the public switch network. I'm going to try to say that quickly. Analog waves were sampled. Binary values were given to correspond to the amplitude of the wave. 8,000 samples per second rendered in an acceptable voice quality across the digital network. It's a pretty interesting concept. Because all you're doing is you're taking, you're taking waveforms as they rise and as they drop. And you're taking an instantaneous measurement of, the, of the, uh, the amplitude of the wave and giving it a binary code, which is actually transported across the network and then reconstituted as an analog signal at the other end. Microwave radio. I worked for a company that was founded on microwave radio. We started by building a microwave radio network between St. Louis and, and, uh, and Chicago. Our entire network was microwave at one point. Uh, microwave broke the tether to, uh, to landlines. Microwave enabled long-haul transmission to become much more efficient because we could put thousands of calls on the microwave carrier frequency. Um, original analog microwave, which MCI was largely built on, had a lot of problems with uh, temperature inversions, fog, and required line of sight. Digital radio mitigated all that. Fiber optics came along and delivered excellent sound quality. How many remember the Sprint commercials with the pin dropping? Yeah. Drop a pin, can you hear it? I worked for MCI and we were a microwave network, so what I used to do is I'd drop my stapler on my desk and ask if people could hear it. <laughs> microwave enabled virtually inca infinite capacity um, through the evolution of optics and electronics on either end. So you, you, put, uh, you put fiber in the ground, and unless that fiber experience, experiences backhoe fade, you can constantly increase the quality and the, the capacity of the individual fiber simply by changing out the optics and the electronics at each end. What, uh, what is actually transmitted over fiber? Light. What kind of light? Colored laser light. So what, what happens is multiple colors, multiple temperatures of laser are transmitted across the same fiber. That's effectively a multiplexing system. It's gotten so dense that it's called dense waveform DWDM, dense waveform Division multiplexing, it's been a while. Packet had his humble origins in X.25. Do we have any X.25 veterans in the room? Once again, the usual suspects. Packet eventually evolved to what we know today as TCP IP. Uh, TCP IP is a very interesting story, and uh, I do need to note that one of the Original engineers on the original TCP IP development team is in our midst this evening. That's significant. 
Because if you think about it, if you think about it, is there anything that goes on in the networks that we use to work with and play with every day that does not that does not use TCP/IP? I can't think of a thing outside of localized Ethernet networks. TCP/IP had its origin, and the, the DoD looked at um, communications technology that were available at the time and noted the rigid hierarchy of the public switch network and the vulnerabilities and said that we need to develop uh, dispersive networks that can operate all over multi-paths. So TCP IP was the, was the packet basis of those dispersive networks. All packets, regardless of what they are, X25, TCP, Ethernet, whatever, have a header and have a trailer and have a payload section that carries the application data in between. So that tells the network that a packet's approaching by the header, sees the payload go through, and, it's, and the, uh, the trailer on the packet says that is the end of the packet. That's how packet networks actually work. I'm oversimplifying radically. Packets, because they had addresses, could be routed. And because of the DOD's interest in de developing dispersed multipath networks, they started work on, the route, on what we call the router in the early 70s. DARPA started it on the military side, and Xerox Park Labs started it on the business side. Xerox Park Labs uh, had their internetworking switch publicly and commercially available in 1974. DARPA con uh, concluded with its uh, uh, first IP router in about the same time frame. Anybody know who invented Ethernet? Hmm? Uh, no, it wasn't Al Gore. It was actually, Al Gore was in primary school when Ethernet was invented. Ethernet was invented by Xerox Park Labs. There's a multitude of, of serious technology that came out of Xerox Park Labs, especially when we get into the discussion on the, on the PC in a few minutes. So, just as uh, the Stroger switch changed telephony forever, the router has changed networks as we know them forever. Think about the rigid hierarchy of the public switch network and how every single call has to set up in exactly the same fashion. The DOD noted the vulnerabilities and the point, potential points of failure of the public switch network and set about the development of multipath dispersed networks. Distributed architecture, multipath networks gave rise to what we call distributed architecture, and that's the basis of 2020 voices technology. The TCP IP gave us a global fabric that was ripe for commercialization, ergo the internet. Little history of the router industry. How many remember Synoptics and Wellfleet? Only a few in the room. They became Bay Networks. We remember Bay Networks, most of us. Okay. Bay Networks was acquired by Nortel in 1998. That was a big, big event. Nortel gave up the remains of Bay Networks to Avaya in 2009 in their bankruptcy proceedings. Any Cisco folks in the room? Anybody know the story behind Cisco? Yeah, exactly. You've got to be pragmatic. There's an interesting story behind Cisco that's probably not quite as interesting as the Stroger switch, but it's interesting nevertheless. As the story goes, Stanford University has a network called SunNet, Stanford University Network. Stanford University's network in the early 80s was comprised of routers that happened to be housed in some, something called a blue box because the boxes were blue. Uh, there were two engineers on the support staff at SunNet that took one of the blue boxes and its operating system as the basis of the first Cisco product. That was in 1984. In 1986, those two engineers resigned from uh, SunNet and founded Cisco. In 1990, Cisco went public. The rest, as they say, is history. Remember Xerox Park Labs and the, uh, the internet working box that they had? A senior scientist at Park Labs founded Juniper in 1996. So you can see where all this technology was commercialized and where it came from. I'm amazed that as far as networks have evolved, and as sophisticated as routers have become, we're still dealing with the centralized hierarchical architecture that remains in the world's networks. And I illustrate it with this graphic here. This is a real-time snapshot of a tier one global MPLS network. 
I blocked out the addresses because if you saw the addresses, you would know who it is. But this is one of this is one of the American Tier One networks, and this is their global MPL, MPLS network. And one thing you will notice from this graphic is how everything revolves around the core, and everything is hierarchical in nature. The fact that Every one of those points on that network is the very best technology available. The architecture itself is 140 years old. Anybody, anybody recognize this monster? This was called ENIAC. ENIAC is widely known as the first computer. ENIAC was 27 tons of capacitors, resistors, diodes, tubes, and about five million hand, hand welded joints. It was said that when ENIAC was switched on, the lights in Philadelphia dimmed. No, seriously, they did. But ENIAC was, was used by the Army to calculate artillery firing tables because it was a thousand times faster than the electromechanical devices of its time. What ENIAC did was establish a form factor for compu computing those, in those days and the way computing was done until a little guy named Charlie Chaplin came along with something called the PC. Anybody remember those commercials? That was a very effective uh, advertising campaign because it really caught the public's attention and led everybody to believe that IBM invented the PC. IBM did not, in fact, invent the PC any more than Steve, Steve Jobs invented the PC. If we were to describe a PC in its, in its basic terms, I mean, we, we, we all have PCs on our desktops. We all have PCs in the form of laptops. We all effectively have PCs in our pockets in the form of our smartphones. But what two or three elements do every one of those devices have in common that say that it's a personal computer? Excuse me? Okay, input, process, and output. We, could we say that every one of them is a relatively small form factor compared to ENIAC? Uh, could we say that every PC that we're aware of today has something called a graphical user interface? Okay. Can we say that every PC that we're aware of today, whether it's a phone in our pocket or a laptop, has some kind of pointing device? The original pointing device was a mouse. So could we say that a small form factor with a, with a, with a GUI and a mouse comprises a PC? Is that a fair definition of a PC? So on that basis, who invented the PC? Exactly, exactly. You've read the book. Has anybody read this book? This is an, this is an exceptional book. If you want to really know the background of the PC and where it came from, uh, the cover says that it's uh, how the 60s counterculture shaped the personal computer industry. And that sounds a little dodgy, but it's actually the truth because the, the PC came about in Palo Alto. And the very, the very first PC, by that definition, was called the Alto, and it was developed in Xerox Park Labs in 1973 in Palo Alto. It was pointed out in the book that uh, young Steve Jobs was exceptionally impressed with the Alto when he toured um, Park Labs his first time and noted the uh, graphical user interface and the mouse. The rest, as they say, is history. I sold a lot of things I shouldn't have sold. <laughs> so ever decreasing form factors and Moore's law has inalterably changed the landscape of uh, computing to the point where our lives have been changed for the better by the competition that puts nearly 300 million of these things in, in, in the hands of Americans. And this, we find ourselves now using terms like uh, gigaflops, teraflops, and petaflops. Anybody know what a flop is? Okay, I have the right people here. And I only bring that up as a, uh, a, uh, a frame of reference. That uh, beast in the background, the ENIAC, operated at 500 flops and consumed 150 kilowatts of energy. F think about that, 500 flops. I mean, that, that's, a, that's a, an incredible rate of speed for a device like that in that particular period of time but it was massive and it consumed electricity like nothing else on the planet. Charlie's little PC with the uh, 8086 processor operated at 50,000 flops and consumed 2.4 watts of energy. You see the comparison? 
it was a 8086, the original PCs. So I ask you, how many flops do you have in your pocket? This is a frame of reference, the upcoming octa-core Haswell. You've heard of the Haswell family of chips. Uh, clocked at 3.8 gigahertz will deliver 973 gigaflops. That's a staggering rate of processing speed. To answer the earlier question about what do you have in your pocket, so, uh, smartphones typically operate in the range of about 25 to 100 gigaflops. So you've got some surly, serious processing power in your pocket. The evolution of storage very closely followed the evolution of computing. The original output of computers was stored on monsters like this, not unlike the ENIAC itself. Storage was, uh, was done through magnetic tape, electronic tubes, and punch cards originally. This is a Selectron tube of the, of the 40s. It's roughly 10 inches long, roughly 3 inches wide. And it stores a mass of 256 to 4,096 bits. I mean, that's a pretty serious piece of technology for the 40s. And that was a lot of storage capacity. Along came the punch card, stored about 1,000 bits. Do we have any Fortran veterans here? Lots of them. Any uh, COBOL veterans? My people are here this evening. Along came the handy travel size. This was the first mag magnetic drum um, storage device called the IBM 650. It stored a, a, a fabulous 10 kilobytes of data. 10 kilobytes of data. Yeah, exactly. One of the first portable devices. And the form factors continued to shrink. This is IBM's first disk drive, the 305. Had a capacity of unbelievable 256 megabits. But it wasn't until Philips came along with their cassette in 1963, and IBM came along with their floppy drive in 1971, that storage truly, uh, truly became portable. And of course, the PC smashed the paradigm entirely because those devices were small form factor, were literally portable, and the product of every one of those devices was entirely portable. So that's 250 megabytes of data on that IBM 305 occupies about four tenths of one percent of the flash drives that most of us have in our pockets today. So what happened to that centralized architecture? And that's really where I'm going with all this. Centralized to decentralized architecture. What happened to that centralized architecture? It was perv pervasive in computing and storage. Everything's migrated to the cloud. Where did VoIP come from? Exactly. VoIP is the convergence of three technologies, the telephone, the internet, and our ubiquitous TCP IP. VoIP first emerged commercially in a little Israeli company called Vocal Tech. It had a product called Internet Phone, clever marketing, that enabled two people with PCs, with microphones and speakers to talk to each other over the internet. It is my understanding that my colleague, Mr. Trest, conducted one of the first VoIP calls, Trans-Pacific, using vocal text technology in 1995. So we're back. With that, this is the 2020 logo. There's a story behind this logo. Graphically, it represents a continuum and a uh, familiar form factor. Anybody remember? Uh, Sun Microsystems, remember the logo? You can see a little bit of it in ours. Uh, graphically, this also represents what we call a distributed network. You can see that there's common building blocks that comprise the network. You can see that there's clearly an edge. You can see that there's clearly a core. And you can reach any point in the network directly from any other point in the network. This, is a, uh, this, this architecture is a differentiator for us, and we've done a number of very interesting things that we're going to talk about in the second half of the presentation. 2020 Voice has built a pure IP telephony network built from the ground up as a totally integrated voice over IP solution. This is a rapid departure from legacy providers that VoIP enable their networks. And VoIP network providers that uh, build complex integrations through the acquisitions of companies. Speaking of Cisco, 
In 2004, I worked for U.S. LEC, and we were a, uh, a lucent TDM shop, so we were entirely a TDM network. But because everything was going void in 2004, we had to have a Me Too VoIP product. So we did this through Cisco IADS. We simply digitized voice through Cisco IADS and handed it off to our TDM network. And that was that was really how a lot of uh, uh, VoIP was provisioned in those days. Was that technically VoIP? Yes, because it was VoIP over IP at the edge. Uh, it was transported across a TDM network. But what a lot of people don't know is most of the larger networks in those days, everything that was carried across the uh, um, the backbones of the network was all IP traffic anyway. I worked for Concert uh, from 99 to 2001, and everything on the Concert network, which is a global network, whether it was frame relay, uh, IP, voice, whatever, was all IP across the network. So VoIP, VoIP has always been uh, the relationship at the edge. 2020 Voice is uh, designed a distributed fabric that uses a blend of public VoIP standards, proprietary scaling techniques that render our own unique and powerful architecture. Key functions are disaggregated from the core and dispersed throughout the network. That's why we call it a distributed network. We have structural and logical uniformity that yields a very high uh, uh, resiliency and redundancy that literally can support hundreds of millions of subscribers on our architecture. Distributed architecture in general is designed with no single point of failure. And as the, re the network becomes more resilient with growth, Our architecture is considered by the industry to be disruptive because of its functionality, its resilience, its performance, and its cost structure. Distributed architecture has already proven itself in computing and storage. So the question before the court is, why does the voice industry cling to the past? This is a picture of our network. This is a distributed network. And what you can see in this network is geographically dispersed core elements to protect the core functionality. So the core can be literally any place within the network. It can be multiple places within the network. It also improves performance and resiliency and dramatically reduces our cost. Core elements include session border controllers, least cost routing platform, rate tables, dial plans, call detail report database, codecs, traffic management gateways, and a master image that runs the entire network. This architecture can process tens of thousands of calls per second. Now, to give you a sense of how fast this network is, a DMS-250, three-bay DMS-250 with three DS3s can process about 45 calls per second. This architecture can process tens of thousands, sir. Master image in a network is, uh, there's, there's a leader, and then there's, there's, a, there's the leader, and then there's the other computers that follow the leader. Because you're in a distributed network, the master, can, the master resides on, on all the, compo all the uh, elements in the network. Because it resides in all of the elements in the network, literally any one of the components in the network can control the entire network, which is to say the network's virtually bulletproof. It's very difficult to take down a network where the master resides in all the elements. The basic building blocks of the network are network high performance fault tolerance servers, and the architecture scales infinitely. We are a distributed network architecture that enables a distributed business architecture. And this is an interesting il illustration of the technology. How many remember the recent Arab Spring? Mike does. You may recall that there was a uh, point in the unpleasantness where all uh, communications in and out of Egypt was absolute, a absolutely halted. Mike managed to slip into a colo in Egypt and put up 5,000 circuits, which were the only call paths in and out, out of Egypt until the unpleasantness subsided. Now, Mike didn't actually physically travel. But Mike did this from his desktop in the south of Charlotte, which is to say we have cores on both coasts. We can literally put cores anywhere. We can put cores any place the markets lead us. Any core element can run and manage the entire network. Core elements can be replicated any place there are network cloud servers available anywhere in the world. And a core can be put up very quickly. It enables us to scale virtually infinitely at a small fraction of the cost of our competition. And we have the unique ability to 
capture spot and niche markets that our competition simply cannot. These are market nodes. And what Mike put up in Egypt was effectively a market node, but Mike, Mike did not FedEx a pair of servers to Egypt. What that is to say is we are able to put our image on servers that exist in data centers or cloud facilities, any place they may reside in the world. As long as we have network type performance fault tolerance server pairs, they're small boxes, they occupy a 2U footprint, individually 1U, half depth. They require minimal power and environmental considerations. They'll support 5,000 subscribers. Think back to the illustration in Egypt. They're imminently embeddable. They can be embedded in data networks, uh, cloud facilities, any place in the world, even in wireless networks. They're entirely brand agnostic. It doesn't matter what kind of server they're on, as long as they're high performance. Our architecture doesn't attract the same threats that other, other networks do. DDoS attacks are virtually useless against distributed networks. These are the logical internal elements of our network. I'm just going to go through these very quickly. Direct inward dialing routing manager dynamically routes DID and toll-free numbers to specific PBX and SIP client ports within our network. Load balancing distribution for up to eight client IPs. Calls per second flow manager manages calls per second and maximum channels and load balancing upstream to our upstream carriers. Uh, SIP is a very uh, interesting animal as, as it relates to the public networks. It can easily overrun a public network. There's an example that happened in the last uh, month or so in the southeast to a household name carrier, a tier one carrier in the southeast, that turned up a call center, turned, turned up a call center and took all their SIP traffic onto their network and then crashed their entire SIP network inside of about a half an hour because the, 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 uh, the, the network's network just simply wasn't able to deal with it. So we have to very carefully modulate the traffic that we send to the upstream carriers that we have. The provisioning back end enables us to provision and manage our client PBX partitions and monitor PBX activities, and it's also the interface to our NOC. Billing and admin platform provides asset billing control and interaction with the client portal. I'll talk about the client portal in a minute. It's our view to client history and internal account tracking. Session border controller is probably one of the most critical elements in our network. It optimizes call routing to our carriers and upstream suppliers. It provides multi-carrier failover and prioritizes load balancing, and it's the call detail report capture point. And last but not least, the client agent portal, which is a web interface for our clients and our agents who sell our services to access accounts, do account setup, do Max moves, adds, and changes, and it's an interface for account status and reporting screens internally. So those are the internal logical elements. The outside logical elements, first of which is our virtual PBX. And our virtual PBX is, you've heard the term hosted PBX, cloud PBX, virtual PBX, they all mean basically the same thing. It enables you to put SIP credentials on any IP phone, on a soft phone, on a smartphone, on a soft phone, on a PC, or on an analog telephone adapter that supports a legacy analog phone. So that's the virtual PBX. Large campus PBXs can be extended virtual PBXs. The virtual PBX will literally extend to tens of thousands of extensions. What we see here is a hybrid application where we're, we're networking a legacy PBX in with, a, in with a virtual PBX using 2020 nodes. High volume contact centers, whether they're brick and, mor uh, brick and mortar uh, using 2020 nodes or they're virtual agents located anywhere in the world that the market's directed they should be operating through the PBX. And the gateways to the international and the domestic PBN. So those are, those are the outside logical elements of our network. Any customer, whether a SIP client or a PBX client, accesses 2020's network through public or private interconnect internet connections through distributed dual path client connections. We are network agnostic. We, op we can operate over any network scheme including MPLS but we don't require a specialized network. So this is basically how each of those outside elements connect to uh, the 2020 core. Dual, dual uh, path, uh, dual registration client connections for the uh, virtual PBX. Same for the uh, the hybrid with the uh, legacy PBX and the virtual. Uh, 2020 nodes through dual client, dual path registration 
for the brick and mortar, and then the virtual call centers that can be located anywhere in the world. How does traffic flow across the 2020 network? Well, any traffic that goes across the network follows a distinct path, and depending on whether it's inbound or outbound, is going to touch different points along its path through the network. Outbound calling is going to flow first through the CPS flow manager, which is the moderator of traffic to the session border controller to our upstream providers. And this just controls the amount of calls that pass through our network and are handed off to the uh, upstream providers. Calls that come into our network come to our network on the basis that somebody dialed one of our DIDs or toll-free numbers. So they, they pass across the PSTN and are presented at the gateway to our SBCs. They go to the SBCs to the uh, DID routing manager because the routing manager determines which client port within our network that calls to be routed to, whether it's a DID or a toll-free number. Same perspective for high volume SIP trunks. Outbound traffic passes through the CPS flow manager up to the SBC and across to the, uh, uh, the gate gateways to our upstream providers. Station-to-station traffic, -station traffic on our virtual PBX does not go up into the network and touch the, uh, the CPS or the DID uh, components, but simply goes in and out of the PBX client cloud because it's simply station-to-station. -station. It doesn't touch the PSTN at all. And the PBX calls that uh, do touch the network follow the same path. Outbound calls go through the CPS flow manager. Inbound calls go through the DID routing manager. This uh, illustrates the duality and multiplicities that enable us to handle massive amounts of traffic so that we present traffic to our carriers and SIP providers in an orderly manner. And this is really just a, a microcosm of the network, but this, just, this illustrates how everything's done at the network level at the core. We have dual path connections. Each SIP trunk, as you can see on the left, has more than one path into our core. So you can see each SIP trunk can pass through either switch one or switch two, depending on where it's going, into our core. We have redundant load balancing that load balances the traffic sent to the CPSs across another layer of redundancy, which is the switches before they pass into the, uh, the CPSs. We have, uh, again, cores on both coasts, so we'll call uh, the, the one uh, core east and we'll call the other west. Uh, CPSA sends traffic to every switch uh, to, to a switch that goes to every carrier, and CPSB sends traffic to a switch that goes to every carrier. So what you've got is a fan-out triple redundancy architecture that ensures that every customer facility has access to every carrier in our, in our network. And oh, by the way, we have 50 PSTN and SIP providers as upstream carriers in our network. Call per second, man call per second management regulates the traffic that's presented to the carriers and the SIP providers. Our network can handle tens of thousands of calls per second. And if we were to deliver tens of thousands of calls per second, even across 50 carriers, we'd shut them all down. So we, might, we throttle the traffic to 50 calls per second. If you look at CPSA in the core, we've got virtual machines running in, in uh, each one of those uh, CPSs that are modulating traffic at about 125 calls per second. So in sum, we have microwave or microwave, microsecond latency across the core of our network. We have the ability to do uh, adaptive routing. We can do dynamic reconfiguration depending on circumstances or market trends. And we can do performance uh, metrics managing from any point in the network. Those market uh, nodes that we talked about earlier are perfect for independent telcos and cable codes because they are the perfect home for these uh, little, pairs of, uh, uh, little pairs of servers. A market node can put an independent on equal competitive footing with as little as a single node that will support 5,000 subscribers. And as the markets grow, you simply add more nodes. This architecture will literally support millions of subscribers. We can also provide uh, SIP gateways for uh, um, more legacy architectures and provide the same node coverage and the same uh, competitive footing for anybody regardless of the le uh, legacy of their network. Ours is a high-value SIP portfolio. This image here represents the legacy calling platform. And legacy pl the legacy telephone platforms were designed uh, to make, for telephones to make calls through limited paths because each path is very expensive. So 
the networks were engineered not to accommodate every phone in the network, but only a percentage of phones that were on, on, the, uh, on a call at any given point in time. That meant a lot of phone, a lot of phone calls didn't get through. This is very expensive to provide a path for every telephone. In the call center environment that needs a one-to-one -one ratio of calls to call paths, it's both, expensive, it's both expensive and a challenge to manage. This is what a call center would look like with 2020 architecture. As you can see, there are more phones available because there are virtually unlimited paths. Agents can be located literally anywhere in the world. They can be in brick and mortar call centers. They can be individuals, any place that the markets dictate. What 2020 provides is a call center with an affordable, always on network and doesn't require specialized equipment or staff to manage. We can provide SIP trunking from anything from small to medium businesses to enterprises. We can provide SIP to TDM gateways for legacy networks, dual path registrations for uh, every point on the network. Uh, we can provide DIDs and toll-free numbers uh, in any scale. We can provide uh, custom IVRs, ACDs, queues, and custom dialing plans for any size network, and provide the technical integration assistance, regardless of the complexity. This is the uh, SMB VPX portfolio. Um, virtual PBX for small um, SMBs to small enterprises, really up to 200 extensions. Can operate on hard or soft phones. Anybody have any experience with a soft phone? It's an interesting tool, isn't it? Use them, have you used one on your cell phone? Have you, okay. Yeah. So uh, hard or soft phones, um, uh, virtually any IP phone that can uh, support a uh, uh, SIP credentials, uh, soft phones on uh, uh, cell phones or PCs. Uh, we can provide DIDs, full free numbers, customized uh, dialing plans, auto attendant, uh, every PBX has an auto attendant. Uh, we, we attach uh, voicemails to emails and send them to a designated email address. Uh, we've got all kinds of flexible options. And every PBX comes with a web interface that enables you to manage your PBX to move ads and changes, or we can do it for you. Really the only difference between the, uh, the SMB PBX and the, uh, high, the uh, higher volume uh, enterprise PBX is we can support up to tens of thousands of extensions off, off the uh, uh, VPBX in a campus setting and, and, and multiple uh, locations. Uh, we can provide DIDs and, and uh, toll-free numbers and volume, custom dialing plans. Again, uh, harder soft phone implementation, and we can provide the technical assistance. I'll let Mike talk to SMS. For some reason, that's a mystery to me. Obviously, SMS, you know it is text messaging, uh, is an exciting new technology. And a lot of our clients, one in particular in the US government, got hold of me about 10 years ago. That's about the time cell phone and text messaging became important. Um, I had uh, been running tens of thousands of phone calls a day for them uh, for first responders. Started it right after 9-11 and I'm still at it. The, uh, I guess that's a good thing about a government. It just won't go away when you want it to. Um, I didn't plan to make that a career, but now I'm running something that's 10 years old and hasn't been changed, and it has to work instantly every time. I took that application and laid it into the 2020 World Network, and I supplemented by having DID numbers. Uh, DID numbers, yes. T real telephone numbers that uh, a client could use to call up the first responders and say, hey, there's a problem. Go to wherever your station is. And uh, they were using this to alert and call the troops and first responders to gather. It used to take them hours. After 240 million of those phone calls later, they finally got the idea that they shouldn't have to call somebody and talk to the daughter or the the kid who answered, Daddy's not here, and not get through to the guy. So as cell phones became popular and they were issued cell phones, next thing you know, we could alert 15,000 first responders in barely 10 to 20 minutes, as opposed to 
four to six hours. Previously, we'd dial the number, play them a message, and they would either respond with tones or call in or just simply go to their rally point of where they're supposed to work. Since then, we've had other customers who want to go onto their website, and they want a phone number on there that says, call or text us on this number. So now they have advertisers out there that are capturing new clients. The, that's the meat and potatoes of advertising, is capturing new clients for customers. And they're discovering that instead of getting the phone calls and operators standing by, they're getting these text messages like a hundred to one ratio of text messages over voice phone calls. They don't want to lose those customer contacts. So they come in, they get captured by one of our nodes, converted to a text and sent to a chat room, or they are immediately responded by an operator who's not on the phone telling somebody something or responding to a customer question, and they're typing it and it shows back up on their text messages. So fully integrated SMS is becoming a very friendly, future-oriented communications technique that it just so happens SIP led the way to blend those two together as well. And we are selling to IT managers, and that's why you asked the question earlier, how many IT managers in here? We're selling that to companies around the globe practically who are now no longer just managing the desktops, no longer just managing the production support equipment, the robots, the mixers, the, the blenders, the whatevers. They're no longer managing their individual applications, be they web-faced or even out in the network. They're coming back blended with a voice data combo. And so SMS is one of our newest hot buttons, and uh, that's been where I've been playing in the last few years. Thanks, Mike. Back on. Total cost of ownership, TCO. 2020, has, 2020 voice has a deep, sustainable, ultra-competitive TCO advantage. Uh, we oper operate against very small, uh, energy-efficient form factors. These uh, servers are so small that they or the image can be located any place in the world uh, or even operate uh, as a 2020 image on machines in Egypt. It's a little joke. This is a TCO chart of uh, one of our competitors that shows all the basic uh, components that go into either an IP PBX or a TDM uh, voice solution. And these are the relative prices across a, a, uh, an equal sized implementation. I show that to, to, to illustrate the uh, relative minimal expense of a 2020 voice implementation. Uh, our lowest price competitor on the, on the right side uh, is, is considerably lower than the rest uh, of the household names within this comparison here. But when you look at the actual implementation cost of a 2020 voice network using exactly the same components, our electricity cost is vir virtually nil because we can use any IP phone. Most IP phones have a uh, power over Ethernet option which enables you to use a single drop for the IP phone and the uh, desktop computer. Network costs are uh, minimized because we use the G729 codec, which uses only 16 or 18 kb per side, compared to the 711 codec that uses uh, 110 kb per side. We provide a web interface that does away with for the need with uh, of telephone uh, management systems. Um, you can use the web UI for moves, ads, and changes. We provide training, so you don't need to have uh, specialized training or specialized uh, personnel on staff to take care of the uh, PBX. Very low cost of implementation, uh, literally no capital cost because it's a, a cloud application. Because we use the 729 Kodak, a minimal or no uh, network upgrade at all. So there are a lot of very good um, IP PBXs and SIP solutions out there. Most of them require the complexities and expertise of the legacy solutions. Uh, if you're looking for a powerful, robust platform that does not require a lot of support staff and certainly not a large capital uh, uh, investment, 2020 Voice is your solution. 
Questions? Yes, sir. Mike? Other questions? Well, we ran on pretty late. We're at, uh, what, 8.30 at this point? We appreciate your attention and your patience and uh, wish everybody a Merry Christmas. Thank you.